Oh, God. <laughs> oh, this thing came on so quick. Okay, well, I know why. I'm using a different device. Anyway, hello, hello, YouTube. It's Mary again. <clears throat> I'm just now coming back on. I want to talk a little bit more about this Akashic Record thing I was talking about last time. And uh, this is what I was thinking about. I said what I said about the Akashic Record. It's a, it's a way of finding answers. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I ended up saying my first prayer because I needed an answer. And, and little did I know I was going to the Akashic Record. So you could call it whatever you want. You could call it God or whatever. But I don't care what part of the world you're from and people in China might call it this and they might call it that, but it's still the same universal part. So uh, go to God. We can say we go to God. But anyway, I was telling you about that book and I heard the voice of God then. But I didn't tell anybody about it. And then there was another time, I guess six months later. This time, I wasn't asking the Akashic Red. I didn't have a question on my mind. But I was able to hear this voice again. And it told me I'm walking home by myself on a Sunday morning, early, like 7.30. I'll say 8, 8 o'clock. And I'm walking, and in the project, you could take a cut through, a shortcut, and, and get to the projects faster. So I was in my mind, I'm going to take the cut through. But I would say about, oh, 100 feet from the cut through, the same voice that told me that I would find the book says to me, don't take the cut through, stay on this side of the street. And I was so happy to hear this voice again. This is the second time in my life I heard this voice. I said, oh my God, that's that voice again. And I stayed on that side of the street. But I could hear this here. You know, like somebody doing that. I'm steady walking. And I'm looking up. And I thought it was a bird. But when I got to the spot where I would have made the cut through, there was a man standing there with his pants down to his uh, ankle, and he was masturbating. And all I did was scream, and I screamed so loud till my brother and my mother and my father came out of the projects and, and got me and, and guided me back to the house. But the guy that was standing there masturbating was named Rover. So I believe had I took that path, I may not even be here today, or I might have been raped. I said that to say this about this voice. And even after that, I didn't tell my mother or nobody that, Mama, I heard a voice that told me not to do this. I kept all this to myself. And I, to me, that was my, I don't know, my comforting blanket or whatever, my security blanket. Because my mother was a very quiet woman. She just didn't talk. I, she was, yes. No, I don't even think she said that. She, my mama said very little. And we didn't talk. So it wasn't necessary to say anything to her. And they told us not to talk anyway. So, But this voice was my little secret. It was my, I, it made me feel good to know that I had, I didn't call it God. I just felt safe. So years and years and years, I, I, I just never said anything about this to anybody until I got like 17. And the church is, like I said, I was, was holding this church. And they kind of indoctr indoctrinate you as to who God is. And you hear God, you hear God's voice. And so I was saying, well, I guess that must have been God that I heard. So I just kind of traded that in and said, well, maybe that's God. And then they started preaching about hell and all of that. I said, well, that's a mean God. But 
I don't think God would do me like that. But I, I wasn't a bad child anyway. But I always thought, and I wasn't trying to do this. It's just my nature. I was a playful person. I, I, I don't know. I acted like a child and I just had a good time. And I think about when I think about the way I felt, it's like when Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me, uh, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And children, when they play, or they don't have inhibitions, they don't have worries. And I didn't have worries during that time. I just didn't. It was just a a good occasion and joyful. And there were plenty of times I could have been sad because we at halftime, we didn't have food to eat. But it was always something to distract my attention, something good. It might have been a butterfly or a cat or a dog. Something always came and took my mind away from the sorrowful thing. So I was just, just a happy child, and I loved to play. So I think if we keep a playful mind and a peaceful, playful mind in every situation, and slow the, the story down, slow, just slow it down and enjoy what's going on. Even when things are looking like it's getting rough, like, oh, I, I know he going to do this. And, and then you have to change the channel in your mind and then find something to make you happy and laugh about it. I think that's when the peace will start to come. But this, this, you, you have to... Um, well, I don't say you have to. I have to always hold this close to me. And so I can remember how I was. And talking about things in the past helped me to remember the way I was. Because like I told you how I was with my papa. Man, he I, he didn't say much. But he just let me climb all over him. He was my tree. I would climb and poke him and pinch him and pull his hair and I had to be about two maybe yeah yeah two and I he was I just played with him so that's what children do and we have to keep that childlike mind and so we can enter into the kingdom of heaven and that is not like up in the sky but the kingdom of heaven is a place of peace and you got to always have that close by it's kind of like children who are not so much children. If people who have a security blanket or something they feel good with or service animal or something, there's something that you have that, that's for your comfort. And, and even we know that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. That's all it is, the comforter. And God is our comforter and we have to learn how to reach for that comforter they may you know say about a pacifier or something but what makes you feel comfortable and at peace and that's just that's about all i have to talk about i'm not doing too much these days just relaxing and i did find another book i read this uh stumbled through this book years ago and harold had it and i found it again it's called The Secret of Light. And it is a really fabulous book. And I hate to, I hate when people say, ooh, it's a deep book. It's deep, it's deep. But if I had to say something deep, this is deep. I'm just going to read one. The book is written in little, oh, little blocks like that. You see that, that square right there? And the next page is a square. It, that's a something that the author wants you to think about. I'm just gonna read something, and a lot of people may not understand it. And sometimes I understand it, sometimes I don't. This one says, "I am the one whole, the all. Glorify thou me, the one who I am, for I am all." And no other is. I, the sexless one, am unity. I am 
thou art. Art thou me? Thou art the whole. Glorify thou self, for in doing so, thou art glorifying me. Hmm. I, the one whole, am knowing mind. I exist to think. All thinking is light of my knowing, but my thinking is not me. I am creator, creating with my thinking. Out of my light of knowing are my two lights of thinking, born as sex pairs of opposites for repetition as sex pairs of opposites. To think is to create. I create with light. Nothing is which is not light. I think ideal. Light resists my ideal in two sex lights of my thinking. And form is born in the image of my thinking. Form has no existence nor have my imaginations. These exist not, for they are not me. I alone existed, I the all. I create my imagined body in the inbreathing of my impulsing universe of me. My universe is my image, but my image is not me. All things are my image but they are not me, even though I in them and they in me. From the divine Iliad, that's where this is from. So, you know, it could be, you could say, well, this, you could this and that, and that, and this and that. And a lot of people do that, man. It's going to blow your mind. This is so deep. And that's, that's a word I don't like to use because when you say something is so deep, there are some things that are deep, but that is in comparison to what? If something is deep, then you have to be shallow. Your mind may be shallow when something is deep. You don't understand it. Just say it like that. Some people say, well, my mind is kind of shallow and I don't understand it. I'm saying this because I remember one time we went to a theme park years ago. And my brother, he was a grown man in his 40s and the kids were coming off the slide and all he had to do is come off the slide and stand up he comes off the slide and hits the water but he's still sitting down and he help 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 me help me i'm drowning help the man the man that helped you off the slide he he said man all you gotta do is stand up and my brother looked around, and the kids were looking at him, and they going on getting on the slide again. He said, Mary, I'm so embarrassed. I said, well, you shouldn't have said nothing. Just stand up, you know. But he was thinking the water was too deep, and all he had to do was stand up. For those who you think everything is deep, oh, it's deep, it's deep, it's deep. No, you have to stand up and pray for understanding and take a bite at a time and look around because, if all the rest of these little old bitty kids coming off the slide and standing up, walking and getting back on, and you're a big six foot grown man, and you saying, help me, you have to watch your surroundings. And you could sit around and holler about how deep something is, and you'll have a bunch of scary people around you that say the same thing. Well, he's sitting there and he about to drown. I got to be careful because I'll come off the slide. I got to, I might drive, drown too. And they don't even get on the slide because somebody said it was too deep. So anyway, I just had to bring that part. But this this here book, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I ain't gonna say this is too deep. I got to pray for understanding with this one, cause, cause the other day me and Hal were reading it, and we I understood it. I really did. I understood it for that moment in time. It was like the room got light, and we wasn't talking to each other. We were just reading this, and after. The reading, we were all quiet, and Harold said, I began, I think I understand that. And then I used the word, oh, it's real deep. And when I said it's real deep, we lost the good thought we had. So 
So I'm going to read it again, but I'm going to cherish the moment and don't fear it. What I was revealed to me, because when I fear what's revealed to me and say it's deep, the uh, understanding just kind of floats away. You know how sometimes you can have a thought and it's kind of like a uh, reaching in a fishbowl and you say, oh, there's that thought. You grab it, but the fish gets away. So the thought just vanishes. So I'm going to take it, take my time and read real slow. But anyway, you guys, you continue on and don't let nobody tell you that it's real deep. Because if it's too deep, you may be just shallow. <laughs> okay, bye.